Welcome to our first umbrella workshop of 2020 called Embracing Uncertainty with our host and facilitator Paula Tim. Paula, I'll just give you a little bit of an intro, is a visual artist, instructor, and community builder with a passion for facilitating wellness through art. Dedicated to learning the connection between wellness and creative expression, a visual storyteller, Paula Tim's art conveys story through bold use of color and dynamic marks, often inspired by the shapes and patterns discovered in urban and rural and landscapes. Paula's art conveys movement and emotion. The use of vivid colors in her work imbues a sense of whimsy in each piece, as well as depth of insight that resonates with her life experiences. Paula has a thriving art practice that blends her love of teaching, writing, and creating fine art. She hosts mixed media workshops and art classes for both children and adults. No prior experience is necessary and all abilities are warmly welcomed. She has exhibited extensively in Calgary. Her website is www.paulatim.com. And um, I just wanted to give you a little background on EAR if you're not familiar with us. EAR stands for Elf and Artist Relief. And approximately 12-ish years ago, a bunch of local Calgary artists got together to support an artist in need who is having a health crisis. And they created an event, raised a lot of money and thought, what a great idea, we should do this for other artists. So since then, um, Elephant has been able to support artists through the flood crisis. And we have been supporting people during COVID. We have actually supported um, 17 people since January, which has been really, record-breaking for us um, and just so you know our grant money that we receive and we would like to thank CADA for their support the Alberta Foundation for the Arts and the Rosé Centre and all of their support goes to support programs like these the donations that we receive go directly to all of the artists 100 percent so we wanted to do free workshops and get people involved and have a more instead of a chatty chat chat thing we had we wanted to do something physical that helped to create a positive atmosphere so we try to support artists being artists in the professional world anyway um our, as jackie said our donation link is up there through canada helps but you know it's free today and we hope we have a lot of fun and i'm going to turn it over to paula thank you Wow, right on. <sighs> Elephant Artist Relief, right? Yeah, it is uh, such a um, cool opportunity to be given uh, today to be with you guys. Uh, so grateful. Thank you very much for having me. My name is Paula Tim, and uh, I am an artist in Calgary, and I'm in my new home studio. So um, a little bit um, about me is... Uh, I am a, a wellness facilitator. Uh, I love using art to get well. And so it would be a perfect fit for me to be here today. And that's why I um, submitted my application to be a part of the uh, Umbrella Talks because uh, I'm really connected to the, the topic of today, which is embracing uncertainty. Um, why, um, why do I think I have a lot of experience there? I will share that with you uh, in the coming moments of today. Um, my life experiences um, have brought me to this position in my life where I am a creative facilitator. So um, I just wanted to say that today is, is not going to be a prescription of what to do to get you like the sort of bio of today was learn how to embrace uh, your uncertainty, get creative and all the things. And so um, in in spite of that title, I also want to give permission for us just to be uh, and experience and come as you are and, and get out of this workshop what, um, what you may. Um, so today is not a prescription, but maybe some more creative tools for your toolbox. Um, and I also wanted to just say, because again, this, the title um, and our intent for today is to be um, helpful but we're not therapists and I'm not a therapist. Um, and so although I talk about creative wellness, it's, um, it's, it's worded that way because um, I don't wanna come across like a therapist. And so if today is 
perhaps bringing up some tougher emotions because this has been a tough year. Um, I urge you to connect with your community, with your supports, and those might be your friends or family or therapists. Um, and on that note, I have some amazing resources. And so we will share those with you in an email post our workshop today. So, um, uh, yeah, um, just looking at my notes, guys. So I wanted to ask you guys a question and you can just sort of, uh-huh, in the backgrounds with me, but um, I wondered, like, did your life come to a screeching halt this year about March 12th, 13th? Um, mine did. And uh, yeah, thanks, Katie. And yeah, so it's like, what, what came to a screeching halt? Like, everything like how to get groceries how to figure out what um or how to pay for your groceries let alone all the amazing cultivations of opportunities that i put into my life that you put into your life whether it was a job or an art opportunity or maybe a commission like just amazing amount of adversity hit us um with a wallop um, in march excuse me um, and for me, uh, I had the added um, sadness that my mom was really sick just before COVID started. And, and so she passed away. And so on top of all the rottenness, um, I had one more thing on my plate this year. Um, so I get uh, why we're here today and, and talking about embracing uncertainty. And, um, and so again, it doesn't mean that um, because I'm giving this workshop today doesn't mean that I... I nailed all the marks and uh, came through COVID uh, without a scar or a bruise or dusty clothes because it was really hard on me too. Um, and I, there was times where I didn't think I was gonna come through this uh, phase whenever it was gonna end in one piece. Um, it was physically demanding, it was mentally demanding, um, emotionally it was a wreck. So, um, and then not to mention our creative um, mojo and the flow of jobs and the prospect of income. So I had all those challenges too. Um, but what I do want to share with you guys today, uh, embracing our uncertainty, is, is about sharing some of the tools and techniques that I've learned over my past 10 years, which I'll share with you shortly, that have helped me get through some of the hardest parts of my life. And, um, and so my, my life story, so to speak, is that um, I always wanted to be creative. I always wanted to be an artist, but I, and from a very young age, and I was, I was sort of all throughout my young years um, or younger years, but it was never enough. And I never felt confident enough. And I never felt good enough to pursue those um, cravings to be an artist, to say I was an artist. And so instead what I did was I, I did lots of kind of creative jobs in my early 20s until the point where I got sort of sick and then I got really sick. And I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease and um, or two and I got sicker and sicker into my late 20s. And I was always trying to manage that dream that I hadn't shared with anyone, which was to be that creative artist um, and run this amazing dreamscape into my actual life. But then I had all these challenges. And so this autoimmune disease um, was I IBD or ulcerative colitis. And, um, and I just would get so sick and I would run myself down and then I would have some wellness time where I would get better and I would do some art during that time. And then I get well enough that I could go back to work and uh, continue my cycle of do a lot of stuff, get really sick, go back home, get sick um, and get well and do art while I was getting well and think, you know, next time I'm going to, I'm going to get well and I'm going to incorporate art into my life all the time because it's just so good for me and I love it and it just fulfills me and all the things but life would get busy and art would slowly drop off the priority list. And, um, and I didn't see it as a priority, right? So um, this cycle went on for, I don't know, 10, 15 years. And then um, about 10 years ago, I really crashed and I really couldn't get better. And I required surgery to get well. And that surgery um, went sideways and there was some tragic mistakes making, made and I was in ICU 
and I almost didn't make it. And so when I woke up, what I woke feeling was the sense of, I just can't deal with that much stress in my life anymore. I need to find a way to live my life with creativity and joy or else. And so this last 10 years has been my mission to do that for myself and bring it to you because that was that childhood dream that, um, that I would do. So um, in sharing all of that, I want to say thank you to you guys for showing up today because just the act of you showing up fulfills my dreams. And, um, and so I was super grateful. Um, and so during those times where I would um, get sick and get better through art, I knew to do that when the really big uh, hit the fan, if you know what I mean. And so I was so weak when I got home that I could hardly lift a sketchbook or a pen, but once I was sort of well enough to do that, I brought the iPad onto the couch and I started working. And on the days where I might not be well enough, I, I watched YouTube um, art videos and got inspired by some of the tips and tricks or creative processes that other people were doing online, which was, um, was such a gift to me at that time, was just watching somebody share their creative process. And it ignited something in me as I was uh, the lowest of the lows and, and just sort of, kept that little fire going for me. Um, and so through that process, as I got stronger, I started to stand and do art and even holding a brush in front of me and, and painting onto the easel or on the table in front of me, that was a lot of work. And so um, to me, all of those steps really infused um, my pain into my work and and my joy through doing the work. And it was through that process that I got to even see in the physical works that I was making, um, really the outpouring of all that feeling into my, into my works. Um, and so that sadness and the trauma, it, it eventually found joy by me doing the work, by me making those marks. Um, and I was actually astonished when at the end, of expressing some of the harder moments um, that I was in at that time, that I could actually see the work evolve from almost what I would say an angry mark or an intense mark to a really beautiful um, expression of, of joy. So that also cemented more for me, what I was doing was going in the right direction. By doing and making, I was expressing what I was feeling, um, and it was coming out of me from the depths of me onto the canvas in front of me as I got stronger. Um, so today in our workshop, I'll encourage you also to open up to your creative process, whatever that might look like for you. Um, I hope today's workshop might help you with some of your stuckness that you're feeling during our difficult and adverse times that we have right now. I hope that today might bring some routine for you to sort of ignite some ideas about where you could bring that routine back into your creative process, that it might open up um, some curiosity in your own creativity and, um, and you might discover something more about what you can do, who you can be and who you are in your creativity. And so there is a disclaimer for all of that. Um, and, and that just is, um, I give you permission today through this process that you're learning to not create masterpieces, um, to not be perfect through this process or any of the processes that you might have in your creations. Um, I give you permission to not be motivated to do any of this work and to not be consistent um, and not to make relevant art because of our times or because of where you are. I give you permission to not be successful or creative or confident during a worldwide pandemic. And I give you permission to lose your momentum. But I also give you permission to make art for art's sake. I give you permission to connect with you and your art and be everything you can be in the moments that you are in. And I give you permission to be enough for yourself. I give you permission to bring space for your ideas to germinate. And I give you permission to regain your momentum at your own space. 
right? Those are some big words, but I really feel um, we just need to um, give permission to be right now. So um, I'm not sure if that brought any criticisms or your little angry critic mindsets here. I often have to tell it to go away. And so I'd like to do that sort of collectively. Um, if you guys want to take a moment and find your inner critic and just place it somewhere within reach so that you can bring that critic back because sometimes that critic keeps us safe and it warns us when danger is coming, but it's a real pain in the arse when you're trying to create or you're trying to, trying to learn or bring in new information. So um, I will start by looking around in my studio and there's a shady spot, spot just behind here. I'm, so I'm gonna stick my inner critic in the box and stuff a bunch of the stuff that's in that box back on top of him so he can't pop out during today's session. I have a very busy critic and he's very resourceful and it is a he. And so um, if you guys wanna just take a moment and look around your space and find a place to put that critic. All right, now in my studio, I'm gonna stand up and just for the sake of um, my space, I'm gonna take my earbuds out and I'll put um, them back in after I'm done. And um, so you guys can still hear me, but I can't hear you. And so what I'd like to do before we start our workshop is just kind of shaking out my, my jitters, my tension. And this is what I do, I call it art yoga. Um, and I'll do this throughout my creative process. And I find this necessary because I get tight and I hold a, like, I think a lot of artists were empathic and we just hold so much emotion in our bodies. And depending on where your practice is, if it's at an easel or a desk or on a computer, we get rigid. And so, um, it helps me if I just wiggle a bit and move. And I was never a good kid in class cause that was me. I was always like fidgeting and moving. And, um, and so you might relate to that. I see Katie smiling. So I think I'm going to, I'm going to say that Katie is with me on this one. So if you guys want to join me, you can, um, and stand up and, and so just make sure you've got some space cause we're just going to do a little physical exercise and a little brain work at the same time. And so what I'll ask is that um, you grab a paintbrush perhaps, because you might have one of those handy in front of you. And in my case, hopefully you guys can see me. So um, when I grab a paintbrush and I'm teaching to people, often, you guys are all artists, so this might not be the same thing for you, but a lot of people will grab a paintbrush and um, right away it looks like I'm holding a pencil. And so that would be how you're supposed to hold a pencil. But when you get into creativity, you kind of want to hold your paintbrush in a different way so that creative marks have a chance to get out of your body. And so as you can see, I'm holding it a little awkwardly. And it could be imagined that is this, is she holding a magic wand or a baton to lead a musical? um what are they called orchestra so in that way that i'm holding the baton just thinking about like what makes a mark when i'm holding a utensil differently so if it's the paintbrush and i'm choked up on the tight on the front end i'm tight and my circles are fairly small but when i pull back on my magic wand paintbrush what have you then i can almost pull away from the tip of it and start to mark, it's almost like I'm a fencer. And so if you're thinking about like how to shift who you are in your creative process as your warm up, maybe if you even just test yourself about how you're holding your instruments, and it could even um, translate to how you're holding an instrument if it's a pencil, because maybe if you hold it more like an awkward um, style of grip, then maybe you're gonna get a new movement that's coming less from this standpoint and more from this standpoint. And so now that I have two things in my hand, I wanted to just um, talk to you guys about the neuroplasticity that we all have. 
And so as a right-handed person, I can get pretty stiff and um, logical and I know how to write my name and I know how to write and print very well. And, and that's all been programmed through all the school that I had. And as soon as I put that writing instrument in my non-dominant hand, I even approach the instrument differently. I held it differently. And so I encourage you to try this sometimes when you're creating, if you're feeling stuck or if you're feeling tired even from using your dominant hand all the time, just pass the baton over here and see what the other side has to say. Because the creative and or the logical programming that comes through your dominant hand will be very scripted. And it does feel awkward or it might feel um, mechanically diff difficult to do things in the non-dominant hand. But it's also that road that hasn't been um, traveled a lot of times from the end of your nerve system to your brain. So you can actually access like a totally different um, type of creativity because it doesn't know that wagon trail. So um, in that note, I know how to write my name. So this is my dominant hand and I'm talking to you and it knew what to do. It just did that and I didn't even hesitate talking. So the non-dominant hand is a little lazier. It doesn't have the same training. It was the bad kid at school and um, it wasn't always paying attention because I didn't have to do half the work that this guy had to do. However, you can kind of um, take some of that amazing fiery knowledge that your non-dominant hand has and give it to this guy over here. Um, I'm just having a camera refresh here. I think I'm still good on here. Okay. So um, what I wanted to suggest is translating the knowledge from one hand to the other. And I feel like a magician when I do this exercise because it's so wild and crazy. And you'll have to do this um, after the workshop and right now if you'd like to do it along with me. But it could be a party trick for you. So as I'm talking, I'm allowing the information to go to my non-dominant hand. And so it didn't have to think about how to spell my name, but as you can follow along, it's P-A-U-L-A. -A. And so I'm not telling my hands how to write, I'm just letting them do the writing. So I'm using script because that feels flowier to me, but if I try to do it with handwriting, I can still do it with whatever that's called, print. So that is me allowing knowledge getting to the access points on the tips of my fingers, my pencil, my brush. And so if you start thinking about it, it slows down the information and all of a sudden you're like, you're looking at your brush and you're like, oh geez, I forget how to spell my name. And you interrupt the process that your brain already knew. So you're interrupting by trying to think it through. And so it's like, it's almost like when you're trying to remember something, it's better if you just stop remembering and it'll come on its own. Your brain is huge, vast, you have no idea how big its computer is, so get out of its way. So that's one of my bigger examples of why non-dominant hand being a part of your creative process is super important. Um, and why neuroplasticity is great for your creativity because you have no idea what you're allowing in by just allowing it to flow. And so that is one exercise for you to try to do to see how much you can do that. So I'll even um, test you if you want to do this um, later is do it on paper after you've done it in the air for a bit and then you can go to your paper and do it. So as I'm chatting here, I'm just going to try to, the camera went the wrong direction just on its very own. So. Pardon me while I get it going again. There we go. The fun of Zoom. Okay, so we're back. So if you were standing, you can come back to your um, work surface and sit down.
Did I have any questions during my little exercise there? Nope. It's okay if there's no questions, but Not just yet. making sure. Okay. No <laughs> okay. So today um, I wanted to show you a bit about the mindful mark making uh, workshop that I've developed based off of some of the story I've shared with you. Um, and, and this is a process that I did um, when I was s sort of unwell and super anxious because I had a lot of PTSD, as you can imagine, after the surgery kind of went south. And so for years, I went to therapy and um, worked on my own um, PTSD stuff. And from that, when I was doing artwork, I could tell when I needed to do art for art's sake or doing art from like production sake. And so um, over the years, I've found even because this process of mindful mark making has, it's actually entering into my um, work pieces now. And I can't even get away from it a little bit. So I'm just following that. But um, when I was unwell, I would do this kind of art and it was sort of like a brain dump for me. It was um, a way for me to keep moving forward during really tough times um, and moving forward both in my creativity, but also I had, um, I wanted to, I had an art studio and I wanted to be a part of what was happening, but I, I didn't have the energy. I didn't have the stamina to create finished works of art. And I didn't want that pressure of um, having to make something that looked good. So I started this process of just smooshing around um, paint and putting down some marks. And I felt like I was being present. I felt like I was being a part of the community making art. And I realized at the end of it that the product was pretty cool too. And other people were really, really curious with what I was doing. And the other really interesting thing was that they saw beauty and joy in those um, pieces. And again, I come back to that because I was starting from a place of anxiety, anger, fear, um, all the things that I needed to get me through my PTSD so that I could get ready for a second set of surgeries that I had just three years ago. Um, and so that was a huge shift for me to be able to say no to surgery, but then say yes to surgery. And so I was doing art to just keep me in the game. I was so dysregulated. I was so scared. And so this art was making um, it possible for me to go forward. And I just wanted to show you what I mean by me making angry marks. So this is a mindful mark making kind of example, but on soft canvas. And, and so it looks to me just like, you know, a, a work of art now, but it used to represent fear and anger and um, just being kind of mad at life. But when I worked myself all the way through this piece, it then ended up looking much different. So I thought, you know, there really must be something in, in it, this process of, of making when it's hard. And why I keep coming back to all of that information is that when we talked um, with the folks at um, EAR, we were saying that, you know, the general consens consensus from artists right now is it's just so hard to um, feel motivated to create. Um, or the comparison devil of saying, well, so-and-so is creating and they're making like profound work based on COVID and pandemic stuff. And, and I don't feel like making anything at all. And, and so I hear that. And, and what I want to suggest is um, maybe today you'll pick up a few techniques, a few tools, and maybe it'll encourage you to, um, I don't know, take a different path right now um, as we head into potentially the second wave. <laughs> okay. Um, so what is mindfulness? Um, really, it's listening to your body. It's listening to your head. It's just tuning in and getting a bit still. But that's not always easy. So it's a practice that um, I think we can cultivate. And, um, and then we can start responding to what we're hearing by implementing things that might bring calm. 
to settle us down. And so once you can recognize it, you can respond differently instead of being in the tailspin. And so, you know, I can feel myself getting tighter and excited. And so then I can just take a deep breath and let it out, let my shoulders drop. That's, that's a way of being mindful. Um, yoga could be another way. Um, tai Chi, lots of the different um, martial arts. Um, sometimes writing can help people become mindful of who they are being in that moment. Um, meditation is obviously a great way of um, be, having a mindful practice just listening to your breath and, um, and going forward with that. Uh, calm music is another way to s help instill mindfulness. And again, with this information that I um, passed to you, just, just know that sometimes being mindful for the first time can kind of be triggering. And so if, if those kinds of feelings are coming up, please connect with um, somebody to help you through that because even listening to our breath sometimes can be triggering. Um, so I, I referenced the um, comment about the bad student earlier, and I, I was that student. I was the wiggly student. I was the kid that was always drawing, always making notes in the margins and doodles and stuff. And, and it looked like I wasn't paying attention to the teacher. Um, and moving looked like I was just wanting to leave, but really it was just my way of tapping myself into the moment and just trying to be here and stay calm. And so those marks, um, if you can kind of tune into those marks that you used to make, uh, those are great marks to make when you're just making for art's sake, when you're doing a mindful um, exercise. I think that tuning into that mark that I used to make repetitively somehow connects me to those moments. And then when I go to make that mark again, somehow I feel like I can even remember what I was doing when I was making that mark. And so I think having a set of marks in your toolbox to make while you're, you're doing this exercise um, can maybe be a practice of being, you know, mindful, but just deepening into it. So um, I'll talk more about some of that as we get going, but I think it's time to do some art. So we'll talk about supplies. Um, basically, you can use anything. There are no rules with um, this process. I, um, I found, oddly, I had some inexpensive paint in my art studio for teaching kids. And I found this process with that um, art, that product was... Uh, it was doing something for me. So I'm, I pay attention to what I like and what kind of brings that comfort or joy. And so I was just using the um, super inexpensive um, deco art paint for my mindful art making. I have since elevated my process where I'll do a lot of mark making with regular acrylics. Um, but for today, this is what I'm going to use. Um, However, you might not have liquid paint. You might have watercolor paint, which is great. Um, and or any type of paint um, would be just fine to use. I am currently going to use as um, a watercolor paper so that I can work a little bit longer on a, on a piece. But when I started this, I started this on newsprint and then translated that newsprint onto um, canvases after I was done because some of those marks were so cool. So um, the, again, a, a sketchbook would work really well. And one of my tips, if you're working on paper and you want it to be a little bit um, meatier, just put a layer of gesso on your paper and let it dry. And then you can start building on top of your paper. Um, as far as mark making tools, if you had a paintbrush, if you had some crayons, um, if you have some jelly pens, you could bring those to the party. Um, there's, those are some of my favorites to use, and you might have some favorite supplies to use as well. We'll need uh, some water and a palette. And if you have tape, you could also tape down your paper. As you know, many of you are artists. Um, if you tape down your paper, <clears throat> it might uh, hold it down flatter and let you work 
a little bit longer, then you get a nice paper frame afterwards, but that's not necessary either. All right, so if, um, I'm not sure if there's gonna be anyone doing art alongside me today, but I'll give you a minute just to set up. And um, Jackie, if you wanna switch the camera to my art camera, that's great. And so um, what I would suggest um, when doing mindful mark making is to get your favorite art supplies um, in front of you and, and maybe limit them to two or three. And so that constraint can sometimes help you be a little bit um, more focused just on the doing and not so much on all the on the process and all the supplies that are in front of you. And then what I am, um, I think is really important is just grab the color that sparks your interest or sparks some joy immediately. So um, for me, I just saw this color sitting across from me and I was like, oh yeah, I'm gonna go with that. And so in this process, you can go straight to your canvas or you can use a palette. Um, and again, we're just moving paint. Um, and sort of what, what I ask you to do it is just um, notice what you like. Notice what is comforting and do more of it. And even to the point where you might make a journal note um, about a process or a combination of colors that sparked some interest. And the more that we cultivate in the knowing what I liked, the better we are in our creative practice. It's sort of like um, when the doorbell rings, make sure you answer it. Um, so when the doorbell of creativity rings, just, just note it. So in this process, there's not a lot of rules. It's just about moving some paint around um, and enjoying the process. Of, of making some marks and, and then noting, oh, okay, that brush was fun for a minute, but I'm not feeling it anymore. Um, so I'm just responding to what I notice. So again, you'll, you'll, you'll hear me be kind of repetitive and, um, and it's for good reason because we just want to do to notice quickly, to sort of create a pattern that it's like, um, hey, I noticed my brain liked something and I'm gonna do more of it. Um, and so if you also notice that, hey, I'm like feeling kind of stuck or bored with that mark, switch hands. So I just switched to my non-dominant hand. And oh, I'm, yeah. yeah. Um, apparently everyone has to pin it their own video of your art thing so you can see, so they can see you properly <laughs> oh I did not know that so on the top okay. of her video where she, you can see her palette you'll see the three little dotted dot marks if you click that you can pin the video and then it'll actually bring it up to your screen I'm very sorry about that I didn't realize yeah. everyone had to do that yeah no I was not aware of that either I thought I, I could do it for everyone but apparently not let me know if you guys have any questions, but that's how you can make it the biggest version on your screen. Right on. Yeah, sorry. Keep going. <laughs> yeah, no problem. I'm just going to jump off and get some white. So I'm just going to open up a little jar of white paint and have that handy. And so you could use white paint as a blender or you can use water as a blender to get you from one color to the next if, um, if that's your kind of thing. And this is honestly like, it's a bit of a prescription of like, this is mindful mark making, this is how you do it. And it's also part of, um, it's gonna look different how you do it. And you can by all means um, mimic what I'm doing to get you to the place where you're feeling your own process. Um, and so I, enjoy scrubbing a brush and so I've got this really inexpensive dollar store brush and um, for me 
I enjoy the, the sound it makes. So I'm tuning into the sound. Um, I'm liking in this moment how some of the coral is coming out because of the moisture from the white. And so what I've developed over my time with this process is sometimes it's the creative work, um, sorry, creative exercise. Or sometimes it's actually going to be like, you know, in on a canvas and it's the background to a piece. But some of you might be aware of, you know, um, that some artists always have like a, a warm up that they do before they start their painting day. And this is mine. And so I kind of jump back and forth between um, using my dominant hand or my non dominant hand and and changing up some of the motions I'm making. And so the other th comment to make during um, this workshop is that um, I call it the creative toolbox. And so why I suggest using um, a sketchbook is so that you can sort of document the information that you're gaining by doing um, and having a routine every day. So how um, I suggest you could try this is attach this process to a daily habit that you already have. Like my morning coffee time um, has always been sort of like a, a beautiful time of my day where I really love to spend a good hour um, just doing something mindful. And what happens is mindlessness creeps in with Facebook and Instagram scrolling. And so if you're feeling that, um, I hear you. And maybe this practice of just having a limited supply of paints close to where your coffee station is or where you like to drink your coffee in the morning and just do something playful, something mindful that is in a sense mindless, that is cultivating some information about your creative practice or just letting your brain have some fun um, by connecting with your dominant and your non-dominant hand. And so when I get kind of bored of a color or questioning or worried about, is this good enough? Why am I doing this? I wonder what I should do about this painting. That's when I change gears. Because um, recall that we put the critic on the side. This process isn't about having critique. It's just about noticing. It's just about being attuned to what's happening. And so if, if it's noisy in your head because it's questioning all those, is this good enough stuff? My recommendation is to stand up and do the creativity. Just change something about what you're doing. Change the station, so to speak. And so um, just by changing it up, being bold, like I just threw green on here and I didn't think that through. What am I going to do about that now? Um, so that I can just sort of quieten the questioner that's in my head. Because again, this is an exercise. This isn't about artfulness. You might get some artfulness out of it. But that's not the main goal. So I just flipped my um, canvas, so to speak, so that I could see it from a different perspective. And that's also like a super valuable tool as you probably know as artists it's just change the perspective um i really loved it this way i didn't sort of love what i was seeing the other way um and then that made me think oh i'll just grab a different color again so just go in those hunches notice the hunches notice the boredom or the questioner and do something to change its brain i'm still using my non-dominant hand so you might go fast, you might go slow. Make sure you're breathing. I'm really grooving on like how the squishy paint feels on the dry chalky surface of the dried paint below. 
And the other thing about this process is setting a timer. Maybe it's five minutes. Maybe that is the perfect time. It could be 10 minutes. But just always like set a time and then continue on. So if it's your creative warm up, set a time. If it's your morning coffee routine instigator, set a time. And what I do with these pieces often is set them aside in their sort of lively Mark Matey state over here and then come back to them when I feel a little slower, when I need a little um, detail time, because you might notice that um, some of your work, some of your art needs big expressive, lots of energy, lots of focus, like make art when make the type of art that you need to make based on how your day is going. So don't do something super taxing when your energy is low or your body is sore. So I'm just grooving off of um, making big marks, big abstract shapes, lots of color. And then I'll come back to this maybe one day, maybe in an hour in today's workshop, I'm not sure. Um, but come back to it and then you can do your smaller detailed work and I'll show you what I mean eventually. Stay tuned. So again, I'm, I really enjoy the scrubby mark, the scrubby paintbrush. And I'm, again, I've really stuck with this one shape of brush. Um, it's giving me permission, this inexpensive crappy brush, to really drag it and push it and kind of let out my day. And that's the kind of stuff that you can kind of um, download. So maybe you do one of these to um, ignite some creative process because you're not making any official art these days. And so this sort of... Um, morning coffee time or whatever time you carve out. I lost my train of thought guys because I got into that color so much. There's something to be said about teaching art and making art at the same time. Um, it's major neuroplasticity. <laughs> So the fun um, thing to notice with this process too is, um, is going over top of something that you love, um, you know, sort of wrecking it. Because when we're doing art, like, I'm not sure if I'm the only one here, but the fear of screwing something up is so high in most people that I teach that you don't push through the creative um, process to get to the other side because you're still protecting the place that you really loved in your art. And so what happens is sort of tragic, but the rest of the piece really evolves except for the place that you protected. And then all of a sudden it's the ugly duckling. Um, it's so unfortunate because why we're protecting us because we loved it so much, but then it ends up being the least dynamic piece or place in our um, artwork because we protected it. We didn't layer anything on top of it because we wanted to save it. Oh, so in this creative process, you can push that. You can test your creative resilience by saying, okay, I'm really protecting this zone. I'm going to, I'm gonna go for it, what if I wreck it? Well, what if? Then you have to creatively respond. So I just got in myself a new color, a new paintbrush, and I put some bold marks there. So 
because I've layered in, I don't know, five colors now, I'm, I'm starting to slow down. I've sat down now. I was standing for a bit. Um, and I'm not sure. Let's see. We're probably into the 20 minute mark of making this, maybe not quite 15. And so now I'm slowing down and doing some marks that I, again, I'm not really thinking about, but I, I recognize where I am. I've seen this loop de loop. I don't know why I make it, but this is one of my marks. And, and I can recognize it because I've made a habit of recognizing what my marks are. And, and I think it's important because then if I'm in sort of the dark alley of creativity, I can start with my recognized marks, the ones that I, I'm comforted by, the colors that I'm comforted by, the process that I like. I love this process. And so when I'm in a sticky spot with my creativity, I go to what I know is comforting. It kind of sparks or invites more. And my brush is dirty, so I've got this ugly, dirty color. So this is going to be one of those spots where I'm like, Whoa, what do I do? And I, I know we're not making this for an outcome, but this is where that sort of, you're in the creative back alley. It's the dark alley of your creativity. What are you going to do? Go to what you know. I am um, recognized through this process of, of creativity that some of my process about going too far and then having to remove is some of my favorite things about my finished pieces. Because it's kind of like the, the area where I let go. And so that begets more letting go because it's like, oh, the other time I, I let go, it worked out pretty good. Now, Here's a time to tell you about my favorite product. It's called a Woody. And you can all giggle and snicker, because I always do. Um, so here it is. It's a, a product from Stabilo. And I'm just gonna get my camera. There we go. And so they're a chubby, short um, instrument that is water-soluble wax crayon. And it's, you know, they used to be called Marksol and they come in a pencil crayon shape as well. And so they're super fun to play with because they kind of, for me, ignite some of my childhood creativity. They, they bring back some of that. So, you know, I immediately handed my, I hate to say this, my Woody over to my other hand and, um, and let it go to town and play. So one of the things I know I love to do, that I, one of those habits that I have in my creative toolbox is to outline. And sometimes I can overwork a piece by outlining, but because this is a mindful workshop, I don't care. I can do it as many times as I want. Um, and this, um, this product, the Woody is super fun because you can, um, you can spray water on it and it'll emulsify or you can take um, a skinny brush and some gel medium and fix it flat or you can take a skinny brush um, as I'm doing here and emulsifying it just with plain water. But I love it because it's such a black pigment. And tracing over your marks is another little trick I have about bringing some stillness to your um, creative practice. So just, it's like um, a racetrack. Just going over and over the same racetrack, you know it. And so I'm just going over my previous marks and I can really get quiet an internal quiet.
just by retracing. And often um, what I have noticed is if I start a painting on this process, it kind of works too, just starting with the woody and then making a few loose marks and then tracing it. And then it's an easy entry for my creative process. So um, you guys would, might be familiar with the um, author Elizabeth Gilbert and she wrote Eat, Pray, Love. And so she did some work on creativity and she wrote a book about it. And one of the podcasts I heard her talking about um, her writing experience for that book was learning about her creative genius. And she, she talked to different artists and writers and poets and, um, and I should actually be able to quote who the poet was, but um, I can't off the top of my head here. But she talked about um, being a young girl picking cotton when she was a kid and she was a poet. And when she heard the thunder of the idea coming down the hill, she would start running. She dropped everything and she ran as fast as she could so that she could get into the house, up the stairs and into her bedroom, to her writing desk, to grab a pen, to get her paper out and, and catch that poem that was thundering over her head so that she could get it into her arm and then into her paper. I love, I love hearing that from that, that poet and how um, important it was to hear the thunder of that creative nudge coming and to be able to race it so that you could get it before it's gone. And you might be able to relate to that when you've got this spark idea of something that is a wildly good idea for you to do as a, a art piece or a writing piece. Um, but you forgot to write it down. You can't remember what it is. And you might not even remember that you even had the idea because those fleeting moments can run past us. And when they're gone, they're gone unless we capture them. So when I say the creative toolbox, um, it's like for me, what I, what I often have suggested to the people that have come to my art studio is um, have a sketchbook that is just that, your creative toolbox sketchbook, where you can capture those ideas that come thundering overhead and just jot them down uh, visually or with words. And you can say, I just love when I do a lime green, a purple of this exact shade with a black mark on top. Those, those notes that we make will spark beautiful things in your painting. Over the years, I've gone back to those books when I'm creatively stuck or have the time to, to notice, to take on a bigger project, like one of those amazing ideas that came to me. So I can look at my resource book, my sketchbook, my creative toolbox and say, okay, maybe I'll try this. And maybe it doesn't um, fully actuate. Maybe it does, maybe it spurs on something else. But the fact is, is that I had a place to go and look for an idea because I visually captured it. So now I'm just taking, I don't know, I think it's Payne's Gray and, um, and filling in some negative space. So again, I just um, encourage you to notice when you need to change gears when you're creating in, in this process. Give yourself permission to just enjoy the moment and not stay with it because it's got to get done. Just gives your brain and your creativeness a place and, and time. Notice how you, how you like placing the paint. Like, did you like just squishing it onto the paper better? Let my camera flip again. Yeah, it did. So I've changed to um, a skinny brush. I'm just going to flip the camera again. 
Um, There we go. So the skinny brush allows me to make some smaller marks. Rather than the bigger brush. Maybe you want to bring a pencil crayon or a wax crayon in. So um, just taking a step away from your creative space um, is a, a healthy thing to do for creative. Just disengage with their piece, walk away, turn your back, come back with some tea and, and you might be, oh, inspired to, to do something different just because you moved. So I grabbed a black crayon and I'm just using my non-dominant hand and I'm just scrawling all over the place. And here's a mark that I love making. It's when you count to five and make these tracks. It's one of my favorite things to do. And so in this exercise, I encourage you to just do until you're not in interested in it anymore. And when you get bored or you, you hear the critic, change game. Change the game, change the rules. One of the things I love to do is scribe through wet paint with a mark making tool. So a, the butt end of a paintbrush works, um, a palette knife works, and so you know, sometimes people are really into the sound and that scraping of things. So being mindful, it's three o'clock and I want to show you how to take a piece that's already done and um, and add some marks with some other materials. So I'm just gonna finish being comforted by the slippy slidey of my palette knife here. And maybe next session that you, you work on a piece like this one, because I've just sort of made mess, like I, I think it was cuter before, but that, that doesn't matter, right? You could come back and get bold and say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put down black liquid ink and start again or you can just throw it away and do something different so in a previous session of mark making I worked on just printer copy paper and I used um, a combination of paint but I think this was just like tempera paint watercolor um, like you usually have for your kids. I'm just gonna show you a sample. So these are great um, to have uh, on hand, even like camping trips, like I'll do um, the most simplest of supplies on camping trips. And I'll take this and maybe a little bottle of white acrylic and a few choice tools and a paper pad and I can actually get, um, you know, quite a bit of visual interest, which keeps my um, inner creative mojo going. And then start using some lining tools to make smaller marks and designs and patterns, because maybe it's not the time of day, or maybe you don't have the time to get all the wet paints out. So then you can start bringing in some of your favorite dry, sort of dry media, if that makes sense. Um, I have a favorite, you know, the jelly roll pen in white. Um, these make such beautiful tiny marks. I'm going to come up to the camera. And you'll learn what your favorite marks are, but 
you can kind of see there's some really sweet white moments in there on the darker. And so again, this isn't making art for art's sake or for product sake, it's for art's sake. So um, I'm inspired to line because that's what I love to do. I love to line and mark and circle. Um, I've even taken a white, thick white paint and gone and found sections. And we'll do that um, in the other piece too, if you want. And so just having some quieter moments and just notice maybe even how your breath changes. Maybe your belly takes a bigger sigh and you let some of your stresses out and you can kind of meander through the to-do list of your mind and perhaps you can tell it to bug off. It's not time or maybe it is time and you want to interview some of the thoughts. It's totally up to you. No rules. So this is recognizably something I would do when I was like listening to a teacher in, in class and just be able to make some marks so that one part of my brain is being super busy, but the other part can listen to the information the teacher is giving. And so I'm going to my go-to marks my work often has flowers in it. And I used to say, oh, I'm never gonna be one of those artists that makes a lot of flowers, but that's what I'm doing, which is funny. It's, it's been a few years straight of doing that. I can't seem to get away with it or get away from it. Um, and for me, the process is sort of a part of, it's pretty important. So I'm just going with it. And so those doodle flowers, they used to show up a lot in the margins of my school books. Maybe that'll spark some memories for you. Like, oh yeah, I used to love making houses. And so this is where like, you know, depending on the background you have, like maybe you want to progress this and, and be in a different mode, like maybe, Maybe there is the messy painterly time in your day and you're like, yeah, that would be really good for my eight o'clock time slot that I have that I would like to fill with something better for me. And then this quieter work that is sort of um, the line work and whatnot. I'd love to do that, you know, in the morning or during Netflix time. Um, it's one of my favorite things to, to create while having a movie on in the background. This, I think this is a new marker. Um, this process is also super good to do um, when you get new supplies. Like give yourself permission to play and find out what they're all about. What do they do when you mix them with another part of your process? It's like integrating a new child. You know, I'm not sure if you guys feel that way about your art supplies, but they're pretty important pieces in my life. <laughs> so these um, marks that I'm making, they just have, um, like the tool seems to dictate, oh yeah, whenever I have the big thick chisel, I love to do the stamp. So when you're in a, in a, a rut in a piece, you could just grab that tool that you know you love doing that thing with. And slowly, just like the left hand knew how to spell my name, intuitively, if you trust um, the process, the mark will come based on the tool that you grab. And so I have to prime these and that's annoying, so I'm not gonna do them right now. I'm gonna go to my jelly pen. So as a gift, someone gave me some jelly pens. I thought, what am I gonna do with these jelly pens? Like. Um, who needs a hundred jelly pens? I got like one of those huge sets. It's been the best gift ever because I can then have these beautiful colors and just scribble away, making a million marks. So 
So depending on the mood you're in, pick the kind of art and the substrate that you're in. So here's a different piece that had, um, looks like a lot of little marks and you can almost have like an art therapist mind when you look at these and go, Oh, I wonder what, what I was, what, what was happening for me then. So I find, you know, um, just by tuning into what the art looks like, I can kind of say, oh yeah, like this week, well, it's been kind of difficult. Look at this week's marks compared to last week's marks. I can kind of see some of the intensity rolling out onto my page. So I'm just using that woody mark again. I, um, I always suggest use, use the tools that you love, that, like you know what they're gonna do. Use those as your entry. And I just did some random circles and random shapes. Um, depending depending on your mood, maybe you wanna um, make bigger marks. This would be a great one to layer over again with a big swath of color. Let's see, like black. Go with your hunches. So I know that sometimes paint is the right medium for where I am feeling like being in my creative creativeness. So when I teach young kids, they just love working with acrylic paint. They don't often get to, and they get so excited by it. And that reminds me that, yeah, you know, acrylic paint, um, maybe even oil paint could be the same, um, but I don't work in it as often. It's like, what is it sparking? Like notice that, you know, the kids, how excited they got about the supplies. Like notice how excited you get about your supplies and pick them up. So I, I met a, an artist um, late in his life and, um, and he started super conservative doing like conservative watercolors. And then by the end of his life, um, cause he's passed away now, he, he worked on some super abstract pieces and he and I shared a common feeling about art and he would say, um, art where you are. And that's what I, I really want to imbue upon us today is um, just art where you are. Notice, notice that and because it's been it's been a tough go guys like I'm not sure how much um, I haven't done a lot of finished artwork but I've been doing art because I know um, from research I know from my experience I know that by expressing we get out our emotions and art for me is a super safe way to express because I don't have to put a narrative around it, especially with this process. I can, I can just sit with myself, um, respond to colors and shapes, sound from the scritchy scratchy sounds maybe that I'm making. Um, I know a lot of artists are really tuned to what sound their art is making depending on what substrate or what brush they have and what vibration it makes on the paper. So there is um, some comfort I'm getting in just using this thin brush and sort of rolling it and scratching it across and um, making, making a new piece out of where this is at. 
here's one of the scratchy tools. So wet paint on top of the old dried paint. I love doing that. Had to do a artwork the other day in an hour for a culture days project at Sea Space with um, the Wavelength project, and it was on acrylic canvas, like a sorry acrylic glass, I guess. Um, and you know, it seemed fairly straightforward, but you know, I haven't. It's not my go-to medium. So what I thought I was going to do ended up kind of going sideways, and so. At the last second, we had 15 minutes left. I started spraying water on the glass and scrubbed it off. And there I was laughing at myself, um, thinking there it is. Like, um, I didn't screw up. I just really like when I get into a stuck corner creatively, I take water and I scrub away the wet top surface. And you can see the layers below and then I can start again. And it's that removal that I love. I used to think I was screwing up. I used to condemn myself and shame myself for being a shitty artist. And actually, it's just something I love doing. And so um, in that new moment that I was in, I remembered some of my mindful techniques. Like, yeah, you're not screwing up and fixing it. You're just doing what you love to do. And it, through that acknowledgement, you access the knowledge, the experience that you actually have, just like the left-handed, the non-dominant hand knew how to spell my name backwards, mirrored. So if you just kind of get out of your creative way, that big brain of ours, it just kind of does, does know what to do. So it's coming on to the 3.30 now, um, being cognizant of time and how long a person um, has for focus and um, <laughs> things on their agenda. I could do this all day, um, but perhaps uh, there's some specific questions that you guys want to start throwing out there. I'm happy to um, engage in a sort of Q&A well, um, we all continue to doodle away. Well, Paula, we actually have a question. I put it in your chat, but I'll ask you directly. Yeah. Um, Katie asks, do you listen to music in the studio? Oh, that's a great question. Um, sometimes. How's that for an answer? And, <laughs> and the sometimes. I, um, I noticed that... I'm affected by music, <laughs> as, as one would guess. Um, and so much so that I start dancing and I start moving to the music and it affects my art. Um, and all of a sudden, um, sort of, I don't know, the process has changed because of the music. So if when it's just me one-on-one, -on -one, I might have something a little bit blander on, like the news mm -hmm. or a podcast or something like that. That's really cool. I like to listen to TV shows sometimes or um, just the podcast, just something to have someone in the room with me in a way. Yeah. Yeah. That doesn't influence colors or shape or patterns and yeah, focus sometimes. Yeah. It's just something to have. It's like a presence in the room. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and Only. we have another um, question. I, Sorry. Can I interject? Of course. Yeah. I had a drawing teacher who people would bring in music and he would get really mad if we brought in anything with words because he felt that the language in the songs flips your brain back to a right brain side and so it always wow. had to be non-word music mm -hmm. which often is classical music but and actually and a lot of us would be like oh whatever blah blah, blah. but since then i've noticed that when i'm trying to get myself into doing stuff uh things with words yeah i either get dancing or i'm starting to sing or i'm starting to talk and it just pushes me out 
of a headspace. Yeah. yeah. But on the other hand, I do like audiobooks and podcasts because they're kind of comforting. Um, one of my favorite ones happened right at the beginning of COVID. I have had the audiobook of Tom Hanks and his short stories. Oh. He narrated them. So it was really comforting voice to have with you. Like Tom Hanks was telling you this story. Mm-hmm. So that was like a really nice thing to have. Yeah. And so just oh, like weird. the, yeah, no. And I think just like the um, left hand, right hand demo, what I did with the writing, um, words, I think I've lost my train of thought, but the words for me, and this is like very me based, um, cause I am super sensitive to stimulation. Um, so the words will drive my project so I have to be careful what I'm listening to if I'm doing a piece that really needs to be the piece um but um like your teacher was saying he doesn't want the words in the songs because they might influence but even the sound for me would influence but um it's it's such a neat thing because um our right brain and our left brain like they they can cross they, we do it in all sorts of things all day long, but somehow we've decided that when we're creating art or if we are artists, we're only one brain, but we are not, we are never just one brain. So, you know, my excitement about learning um, more about my own connection to, to that is, is allowing the crossover. Cool. That's a great answer. Um, would you like another question from Katie? <laughs> sure, um, yeah, love it. Uh, she says, what time of day is your best studio time? Or does any, anyone have a t- particular way they start or finish in the studio like meditation? Yeah, what a great question. Um, I used to think I was a late night painter. Um, and although I love it, I don't do my best work always. Um, so as I age, for sure, I need to do the core of my work when my body is the strongest. So not first thing in the morning, but like, you know, 11 to six kind of thing is probably my best time to work. Um, and an interesting um, story on this, my aunt is an artist and um, she and I were at a residency together and she had this project where she was completing a thousand photos and they were 10 by 10s. And she had a deadline to get them done and that deadline was fast approaching. So of course we were visiting and having a glass of wine. And so what she noticed is one glass of wine was like a creative warm up. It limbered her to get her moving a little fluid, more fluidly, but two glasses of wine, although she felt like she was more creative and she felt like she was moving faster and getting the looser marks, which was her intent the next day she could look and see that it was actually messy and um, sort of muddy and not quite as her voice. So she realized that she had a limit when, when sort of drinking and doing (laughs) wine. Yeah. I I do drink in my own studio, (laughs) but I have noticed too much gets too far and you know, yeah, it's not what I want to do anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Do you do any meditation near the end of the uh, studio time or anything like that to finish off your studio part, like your day kind of thing? Do you have any like ritual for that or? That's a great question. I don't actually, but um, probably if I got more mindful about it, I might notice (laughs) that there is um, a process, but um, the times with uh, friends we're creating on zoom together. And so, um, having a public art practice or a public studio before we would have art nights together. Mm -hmm. And so we've created these art nights on zoom. So we're not facing the camera. We don't have the pressure to interact sort of through the digital, but we're still communing together. Um, So at the end of those nights, we kind of have a round table share of um, what we've produced and how we are connecting to what we've produced. And I I always really find that um, good for my soul good for my creative mojo. It sort of implants the day. Um, It just sort of registers. And so I think it's super good to just be, uh, to acknowledge without that inner critic being the larger voice, but just to know 
you know, where you came from today. Oh, cool. Thank you. Um, that's it for my questions so far. If anyone else has a question, please feel free to either message me or even voice up right now. Um, as long as we don't have everyone doing it all at once. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll give maybe a people a few minutes to respond. Um, right. But you can keep going, Paula, if you'd like. Yeah, I'm gonna, uh, this is coming back to the piece that we started with, the same orientation. Or no, it's upside down. That's okay, I like it. So I'm gonna go in with some white paint. And um, I usually like using a really thick white paint, but um, I left it at my other location. So we are gonna use a fluid. And I just wanna play with this piece, adding some white details um, and maybe some marks. So um, does anyone have questions about um, the products that we're using? And uh, if so, voice up. So I've got nothing so far. I can always make, if you send me a list too, yeah. I can always send it to people. Yeah. Um, so again, the creative toolbox is knowing what marks, what colors, what combinations that you love to do. Um, and when thinking about COVID and how um, it's been really hard on creativity, the things I've heard from my community is I don't create well by myself, so I haven't created anything. Um, thus the Zoom suggestion to do Zoom nights with your friends. 40 minutes you get for free and then you can just refresh um, and continue on. It's been super um, great. Some of my friends that have kids can join after the kids go to bed and we've had some really um, productive nights. Um, okay. I got a question. Yeah. Uh, what is the white pen you're using now? And I think I lost so, your video. <laughs> oh. Oh, no, I got it. Is it there? I it's flipped again, it does it? Yeah. It's really weird. Um, good old Zoom. Mm -hmm. Thanks for being understanding, guys. Um, there we go. So I have a question. I, another question right yep. after that. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So the pen I'm using is called Molito, and they are acrylic uh, pens that you can buy refills for and um, they come in different sized nibs and so this is a four millimeter round and um, I love the white because it's got such a heavy pigment that if I put paint over top of this white mark that I'm adding it will almost still shine through not almost it, it shines through the next layers of color and it's so solid and as far as like doing things that you connect, like doing a mark that makes you feel good, this is one of those mark making tools. I just freaking love it. Um, so do things that spark joy with things that you love. Awesome. And so that's, these are the huge ones. These are 15 mils and they come in even tinier. Awesome. Um, another question was, are you using a multimedia paper right now or a watercolor paper? I am using the cheapest paper ever, and I want to show it to you. I think um, it's just a watercolor paper, and um, I think I got it at the dollar store, and I got it for summer camp to teach summer camp. Mm -hmm. um, I'm looking. And so if, um, if you don't have watercolor paper that you would get inexpensively, you could use just copy paper um, and that's what this is and I didn't even tape this paper down so that it didn't buckle and this is just a 20 pound the least expensive paper that you can get at cost or uh, staples or whatever um, and I, I just can't believe how great it shows up you know mm -hmm. it's dead flat um, awesome and here's um, an example oh. of tape by the way um, if you tape it down, you get an edge afterwards. So it's kind of fun. With the green painters type type thing, right? Yeah. 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 
Um, I have another question. If you're done with What's that up? answer, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it says, I am phobic to graphic design because of, I have had Ooh. lots of panic attacks slash negative associations when participating in graphic design ever since a freelance graphic design project went south a long time ago. Any tips or words of encouragement for overcoming my phobia and beginning to slowly enjoy graphic design again? Oh, wow. Thank you for sharing. That sounds like a really tough story. And it's like, like when we have those experiences, how can we get through them to, to experience another new experience again? It's like a PTSD scenario. And so, so brave of you to share. And so my immediate answer feels like um, practicing on your own time to build up your knowledge and comfort and walking yourself through some of the angst um, that comes along learning something without pressure. Um, so uh, that's exactly why I learn so well on my own. So I, I do a lot um, of my own marketing and my own all these things. And, um, and then once I feel confident, then I can market those as a skill set that, um, that I can put out there. And so if there is a learning curve, you know, at the job, um, I, f I guess I feel like I have enough um, supports around me, whether it's my knowledge or my community or the people I'm working for that I can kind of say, hey, I'm in new territory. I just, I'll figure this out. Um, does that answer the question? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't have any other questions at the moment. Well, maybe me personally. Um, I have a question yeah. for you, Paula, because I do actually suffer from an autoimmune disorder as well. Um, yeah. What do you say to yourself when you're having those days of just not feeling good and you just want, you feel so bad for not being productive? Mm. Like, what would you tell yourself or what would you, you know, try to get yourself out of that funk? Oh, such a good question, Jacqueline. And um, it, you know, it's like, it's a constant question. Mm. Um, that I have almost in, in my daily life, because even though I've, you know, I still, I still have my autoimmune. So I still have days um, where I don't, I'm not my best self. And I have a huge community, which um, might be on here today, even um, that also has like a similar um, disease to me. And um, we can, we can connect and support each other. So for sure, I'll lean back on my original words um, which is like have a community because mm -hmm. those, those days where you're not creating because, or not producing because you're feeling like garbage. Um, and sometimes they're not just days, they're weeks or months. Um, and it can be scary. It can be nerve wracking. It's, it's so hard. So have a community. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I used to have, um, it's not everyone's word choice, but it connects with me. So it's called um, a pity party. <laughs> and so as a person that's had a chronic illness for almost 20 years now, um, actually 20 years this year. So I would give myself permission to have full suck days. So no trying to make it work, no trying to make the event, no trying to clean the house no nothing just a full-on embrace the suck day um just a full recuperation day a full flake out permission to do nothing day um and feel it and and go through the feelings and however that looks depending on where i am at in my life giving myself permission to um just say you know what there is no sugarcoating this this is just really hard stuff and so just like covid or just like having an autoimmune um we can't be perfect makers every day. We can't be perfect providers every day. So just giving yourself permission to feel the feels. And um, the, the, the trick with my pity party is I set a start and an end time for it, just like any good party. And so there isn't a desire to continue being self-pitying because as a chronic ill patient, I need to be buoyant. I need to rise above. I need to power through more often than not um, because I still have to go to work or make a living and stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. So I find just 
submitting actually recovers me a bit faster than trying to make that day a productive day. Well, that's great advice. Yeah. I could see that working for any type of illness or mental illness or just something to yeah. give yourself permission and, to relax. Yeah. And just like the COVID times, right. With the creating, it's just like, don't tr like, don't try to be creative every day. If every day isn't just a good day to create. Cool. Thank you. Um, yeah. I don't have any more questions at the moment. Um, okay. Do you want to keep creating or <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure. To keep, yeah, I can, let's create a bit more and just see where, um, where it takes us. Um, sure. Timing wise. Uh, if anyone wise, maybe yeah. we could probably wrap her up around four or maybe a little bit before yeah. four, just to give people a perspective yeah. of how much longer. Um, yeah. Yeah. So just keep going. And if questions come, I'll interrupt you. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Cool. <laughs> so, um, as you can see, we are adding some white to my current piece and, um, this is sort of where I start slowing down again in the mark making sort of design phase um, is looking for interesting shapes and um, and maybe blocking them out and it doesn't have to be white but that's what I'm into at this very moment it's kind of connecting the dots that I did on the other side um, the woody by the way comes in lots of different colors. I prefer the black because it has the highest strongest um, pigment and The other color is like full spectrum of colors. Um, they're not as intense and I love the application of water to them. So that's a, again just noticing what you love and doing more of it. So with the woodies, I love adding water and seeing those marks kind of bleed out and get um, um, transformative, right? So the other colors, they do that, but they just don't do it as beautifully. So, um, that is a tip on the woodies. And then, um, so here I am just outlining and making shapes and and I, I'm not looking at it as a composition. I'm not looking like, what should I do next because of that? But I'm sort of staying in, um, in a style, which is just using my white and going around and, and playing with it, um, uh, blocking out shape, finding shapes, just sort of staying in a personality, so to speak, of that. Um, and in your process, you'll find again, marks and or supplies that will tell you, oh, I, at this stage, this is what I like doing. Because it's not really about mimicking my outcome, but just sort of taking my tips and planting them into your process. So um, the jelly pens or markers, uh, they're great for the, you know, adding some details or getting smaller. Um, I also really like them because of their, they're kind of juicy flowy. So for me, um, a part of my creative toolbox is um, the fluidity of and the scruffiness of. So I love, you know, scruffy, imperfect marks. And then I love you know, juicy, flowy um, marks. And so different colors do that for me. And that is what I know about my creative toolbox. And so when you're not well enough or you're not feeling like creating a bigger artwork, just tuning in to this kind of mindful art making can help to sort of brain dump the struggles of your day, whatever you're holding on to in your mind, because you're letting it work in some formation in the background on that stuff. And then another part of your brain is playing over here with colors and lines and shapes. And so you can just go back and forth between adding tiny marks and bigger marks. Um, 
adding areas that your different moods can go in and detail. Like, so I've just used um, the jelly pen to go around these white paint marks earlier. So just like the comment I made earlier about the racetrack of your mind, like going over your own marks repetitively has some wellness to it. It's um, neurobiology of, of doing these kinds of things is proven that, you know, all, all of this stuff, repetitive marks and giving your, um, your brain some time to just not have a plan and just paint just play it's very good it's very restorative so can you imagine if you made this a practice um, alongside some of the busier stuff in your life how much well more well we can be or how much more dynamic maybe it'll make your other creative processes So at the end of these mindful exercises, um, again, remember I had suggested taking a look at the time and saying, you know, I'll, I'll set the time so that you don't feel like it's a struggle to get a completed piece. Set a 10 minute timer or 20 minute, whatever that magic number is for you to stay in a creative mindful place. And maybe you want to build on it. Like I've come back to this piece a few different times, letting pieces of it dry. Um, and just find a way to for for this new exercise to be fun and inspiring but um, not laborious and another thing that you've got to do well at <laughs> be careful don't get trapped um, so again being um, cognizant of our time and knowing that things are wrapping up, like um, any more questions for us? I'm happy. So far, I haven't seen any. Okay. Uh, but just uh, I'm going to plug in some ear stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if I totally can. You uh, totally can. We have a few more uh, ear workshops until the end of December. They are all free and they're all going to be all online. Um, some of them include we're going to have some curators and local galleries. Uh, join us in a Zoom converse, conversation to talk about how being how to get picked up by a curator or a gallery. We're going to have um, a spoken world, word panel featuring some local uh, writers and poets, and they're going to talk about their practice and how they do their writing job. And wow. we're also going to have another one where we're going to hire some local artists, uh, visual artists, to talk about their their careers how they got to where they are, tips and tricks on how they managed to make themselves professional. <laughs> and of course, we always have our MFA talk with um, our wonderful administrator, Marianne Elder. <laughs> um, just keep an eye out on our Facebook. Um, right now, our website's kind of going under development. Um, so not too much info is going to be posted there. But if you guys are ever struggling and need some financial help, for any emergency crisis, please go to our website and fill out an application and we can hopefully give you a grant, uh, some funding. <laughs> um, I'm not sure what else to add. Katie or Jill, do you wanna add anything before we start to wrap up? Sure, I just want to thank you, J Jackie, for all your hard work in getting this organized. Mm -hmm. Paula, the, I just can't stop watching what you're doing yeah, so fun um, I, it's really uh i think the best part was just here let's make some stuff and you have permission to not make a finished thing yeah that was just the best um i really want to thank you so much for this and i'm so glad you applied and let us know 
what you can do because um i think this was just so fun i think well, thank you crazy things now but <laughs> they're totally new for me and i'm really yay excited. yay um, yeah i want to thank the board and um all the hard work of marianne and jackie thanks oh i also wanted to add this video is being recorded so that um you guys can view it anytime you want for free <laughs> whenever Great. i put it up <laughs> <laughs> well, when we get there. Yeah. <laughs> I also wanted to add a couple things. I wanted to say thank you so much, Paula, for, for this. It's yeah. been thank you. awesome to um, listen to how you how you developed your your process. And um, I can relate. I've I've uh, I've used similar um, processes myself to get through um, illness and whatnot. So it's really nice to see somebody um, demonstrate and also talk about it so articulately. Um, mm. So that's, uh, thanks, for, thanks for sharing all of that. Yeah. You guys, I am so honored to be a part of this today. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. And thanks again, um, Jackie, for mm -hmm. um, everything you did to pull this together, and Katie, and everyone else involved. So, um, I'll be sending out emails to everyone for a survey and just a list of stuff uh, uh, Paula has mentioned throughout the video. And if you guys want, you can also, if you made a piece and you want us to share it on our Instagram, go right ahead, and I'll do that for you. I think that'd be really Ooh, cool. Very cool. Oh. Yeah. What do I do? We just take a picture of it and send it to. Yeah, just send it to your programming. The same one that you got the link from. Take a picture, take a scan. As long as you can see it, send me your social media info. <laughs> cool. Oh, I'd love I'd to love see to that. See what everybody did. If, if you're comfortable, you don't have to. No, yeah. Yeah, of course. Well, is there anything else you want to add, Paula? Uh, well, I guess. Um, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm so grateful that you guys have uh, attended today and uh, connected with me. Um, I am super available um, for all sorts of opportunities, whether it's just engagement to um, get some feedback for yourselves. If you have any questions about the products, um, Jackie's going to be sending something out uh, with some resources for you. So um, I'll have my information on there. Please connect with me if you've got anything um, to chat about. Uh, thank you so much. This is such a, um, a unique workshop to present. And I just felt really held by both EAR and the community that's here today. So thank you.